It is a great pleasure to welcome Wurundjeri Elder Uncle Bill Nicholson. Uncle Bill has worked in cultural education for over 20 years. He currently works as a cultural education manager at the Wurundjeri Council. I would like to invite Uncle Bill to do the welcome to the country. Yes, sir, thank you and uh, good evening to everybody. Now, welcoming people to this land it's not just a speech to me, it is actually a very uh, important part of our cultural protocols and cultural law, actually. And talking about uh, my particular connection to this land through the Wurundjeri community, we had our own language as well. We call Woiwurrung. And I'd like to start off welcoming you, you to country in language. So, Wurundjika, Gabamala Mangil, Barambun Yalanbu, Wurundjeri Balak, Nirina Marinbik, Bill Nicholson. Yes, uh, as you could work out there, I don't have a tribal name yet. Something as part of our cultural practice we'd like to bring back one day. But uh, I'll just translate that for you. So uh, that is uh, greetings from me. Welcome. Good day from the Wurundjeri people. My name is Uncle Bill Nicholson, and I'm very proud to stand here representing my community as, a, as an elected elder uh, amongst my community. As, as welcoming people to land, if you've heard them before from any other elders, uh, or even myself, you may have uh, heard the elder mention acknowledgements. We acknowledge our elders past here in this state because it wasn't for their ability to adapt to environmental changes over tens of thousands of years, have the very strong structures that we live by for thousands of years, and the last 200 years of extreme difficulty, you would not have any Aboriginal people living in the Victorian community today. So I'd like to acknowledge Elders' past for our culture, our strength and our identity and survival. I'd also like to extend that to something you probably didn't hear about if you were educated here in Melbourne, the Frontier Wars. I'd like to acknowledge every fallen warrior, both men and women, who fought for their lands and their families and their country. I'd also like to acknowledge the fallen clans that aren't here to be represented in today's modern world. So traditional culture. Uh, as an educator, um, there's quite a lot that I could uh, sit up here or stand up here and explain about, but I'll give you a little bit of a snapshot. Sustainability, sustainable. If uh, people call us the oldest culture in the world or continuing culture, we're obviously a very sustainable culture. Uh, very knowledgeable through the extended family input into young men and women. So when they hit adulthood, by the way, a lot earlier than what you hit adulthood today, you knew your roles and responsibilities to be a mature adult within society. A very um, structured society through traditional laws. A very efficient society. Um, two to six hours a day to sustain your family. Probably a lot less than what you actually work today to sustain yours. And also a very fit and healthy culture. And uh, well, being here in Melbourne, I've got to, I've got to give this uh, explanation. A possum skin ball booted in the air and people would fly through the air even jumping through the air and on the backs of other people to grab that possum ball. Well, today they call it AFL, um, traditionally called Mangrook, and played all over this southeastern part of this great continent of Australia and a, a symbol of our fit and healthy lifestyle. So why have things changed? Why are Aboriginal people one of the unhealthiest mobs, as we say, basically in the world? Why is our cultures in a lot of parts of this country struggling to keep its head above water? Why is there a, a major disconnection of country and family? Why is there high incarceration rates, some of the highest in the world? And why are our suicide rates skyrocketing? Well, there's a reason for that. These are something I would not wish upon anybody in any society or culture or community group or whichever way you like to identify. The term reconciliation, reconciliation week that we just uh, went through, um, I had to look at the uh, dictionary to find a, an actual definition. And what I came up with was the restoration of friendly relations. My question about reconciliation is when did friendly relations begin? I'll give you a little bit of a snapshot. The Mindai plague, which we call smallpox, took out nearly 99% of the population of this area before John Batman came here to create the first treaty, which also failed. Um, Simon Wonga, a number of years later, Wonga Park in the eastern suburbs, named after Simon, great inspiration to myself, adapted our people from traditional living to living in one place, or agriculture. We were very good and successful at that. But William Barak, who was a predecessor to uh, Simon, one of the first human rights fighters in this country, 
commented, why are we being treated like criminals when we have done nothing wrong? We want our freedom. We want our own ways of making our decisions for our people and our country. These are questions that are still being asked by the Aboriginal communities, or the Wurundjeri community I'm speaking for, still today. The discussion around recognise, constitutional change, treaty, all these different discussions are all based on creating self-sustainability and capacity and resource amongst the Aboriginal communities so we can turn around a lot of these intergenerational traumas because unfortunately in the past, structures that have been imposed on us have not worked. So it needs to come from the Aboriginal community and I totally believe that. So, <clears throat> look, there's a number of aspects of history that I could go through, but I won't go through them all. I think uh, as, we are, as we are all Australians and we live here, I always uh, say to people, a cultural message that we give to everybody, and you don't have to be Aboriginal to have this message. If you call this place your home, you must understand this place and help care for it the best you can and help care for one another. Because that has been a message here for thousands of years and it still continues today under traditional laws. So, um, talking about traditional law, welcome to country is actually one. It's called Tandaram. You had to do it. Or um, you were considered a trespasser. So it's like your passport today gives you access to someone else's land. You don't go live in someone else's land, you eventually come home. That's the same concepts. So we would send out message sticks, a period of time later people would gather. The offering of vegetation symbolises your access to the resources here. Snapping of spears symbolises your safety. And the walking through the smoke, we're a very spiritual mob, Aboriginal people. Uh, we believe in a continuing existence even after your physical body falls and you go into that spiritual world we call Morup. So we believe in both good and bad spirit. So walking through the smoke of the smoking ceremony is a symbol of cleansing of spirit and of country. Now lighting the fire in here is a bit impossible so I won't do that. But I'd just like to say to feel truly welcome, you must respect country, people and culture. If you do, Wurundjika Yemen Wurundjik Balak Ulambiq is a welcome to Wurundjeri home, welcome to Wurundjeri country, and I really hope you enjoy your evening. So thank you. Thank you very much, Uncle Bill, for your generous welcome to country. It's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Linda Christensen, Vice Chancellor Swinburne. Appointed Vice Chancellor in 2011, Professor Christensen guides Swinburne's vision to be a world class university, creating social and economic impact through science, technology, and innovation. I would like to invite Professor Christensen to join us. Thank you, Andrew. And may I also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where we're gathered tonight, the Rwandri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to elders past and present. An acknowledgement to Uncle Bill Nicholson. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. I always appreciate your welcomes to country, uh, and um, I consider you one of my teachers, so thank you. Uh, may I also extend a warm welcome to Professor John Maynard, the Professor, professor of Indigenous History at the University of Newcastle. Thank you for being here. Thank you for getting onto the plane in Sydney when there was all that weather and commotion, and appreciate you making the journey to us and we look forward to your wisdom tonight. Um, a warm welcome, I won't name everyone, I'd love to. Uh, you're all here because you are part of our Swinburne community. So academic staff, colleagues, uh, family, friends, students, thank you so much for being part of this important evening for us, the Swinburne Reconciliation Lecture. This lecture marks the culmination of an exciting program here at Swinburne, acknowledging the importance of National Reconciliation Action Week. In 2017, National Reconciliation, Reconcilia, it's a hard word to say. We need a new word, Uncle Bill. <laughs> ne Reconciliation Week reflects on two significant anniversaries in Australia's reconciliation journey. 50 years since the 1967 referendum, and 25 years since the historic Mabo decision. While we commemorate these significant milestones, we ask all Australians to be part of our nation's reconciliation journey. As part of Swinburne's commitment to National Reconciliation Week, we have held reconciliation, I'm gonna say this right, <laughs> I will. Morning teas at our Hawthorne, Croydon and Winterna campuses. A national sorry day commemorative event 
We hosted indigenous walking tours, which connect us and help us understand the land where we have been welcomed. And a unique lecture on indigenous astronomy, which is just a fascinating uh, intersection because of our world-class expertise in astronomy and then the 60,000 years of wisdom that has passed forward to us. And when you bring those stories together, it's amazing how similar they are. Today's lecture is a special event because it signifies Swinburne's commitment to reconciliation and our intent to increase our understanding. So we are here tonight as learners. As a university, we aim to ensure Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's heritage, knowledge, and cultures are recognized by our community and embedded into the many ways that we work. In 2014, we launched our first Reconciliation Action Plan. This plan recorded our commitments to the education and training of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, organizations and communities. This plan also charted our aspirational goals and the actions that we wanted to undertake to bring this action plan to life. The, the RAP aims to contribute to addressing social issues including education, health and employment to engage and support the participation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in education and employment, to build an inclusive and supportive culture, and to create, enhance, and maintain strong relationships with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, organizations, and individuals. We seek to create a university culture that is enriched by our RAP, that actively promotes knowledge sharing, strong relationships, and lifelong learning environments. So I'm very pleased to report that we are currently finalizing our second Reconciliation Action Plan. Thank you to Andrew Gunston, Andrew Peters and the team for progressing that work. And we are excited about the next steps that we will take on our reconciliation journey. Reconciliation must live in the hearts and the minds and the actions of all of us. Swinburne is committed to contributing to creating a nation that is respectful and fair in our relationships between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and other Australians. Tonight's event is a significant step forward in this journey. By being here tonight to share, listen and learn, you and we demonstrate our commitment to reconciliation. So thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much, Vice-Chancellor. I'd like to acknowledge Professor Christensen's strong leadership and support of reconciliation and Swinburne's engagement with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. The Vice-Chancellor mentioned that tonight's lecture marks the culmination of an exciting program of events that Swinburne has held commemorating National Reconciliation Week. I'm delighted to say that there's been over 650 people, staff, students and the general community that have attended these events over the last two weeks. The Swinburne University Annual Reconciliation Lecture is a key element of Swinburne's Reconciliation Action Plan. Each year an eminent Australian is invited to present the lecture in regards to their specific area of expertise. The Annual Reconciliation Lecture is designed to advance understandings of reconciliation in the wider community. It is now with great pleasure that I welcome and introduce our 2017 Reconciliation Lecture Orator, Professor John Maynard. Professor John Maynard is a Warrami Aboriginal man from the Port Stephens region of New South Wales. He is currently Chair of Aboriginal History at the University of Newcastle and Director of the Puri Global Indigenous and Diaspora Research Studies Centre. In 2014, he was elected a member of the prestigious Australian Social Sciences Academy. He gained his PhD in 2003, examining the rise of early Aboriginal political activism. He has worked with and within many Aboriginal communities, both urban, rural and remote. <coughs> Professor Maynard has held several major positions and served on numerous prominent organisations and committees, including Deputy Chairperson of the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies, Executive Committee of the Australian Historical Association, the New South Wales History Council, 
Indigenous Higher Education Advisory Council, the Australian Research Council, Council College of Experts, and where he's Deputy Chair of Humanities. Uh, he's also serving on the National Indigenous Research and Knowledges Network, and he's also been a Fulbright Ambassador. Professor Maynard's publications have concentrated on the intersections of Aboriginal political and social history and the history of Australian race relations. He's the author of a number of books, including Aboriginal Stars of the Turf, Fight for Liberty and Freedom, The Aboriginal Soccer Tribe, Aboriginal in the Sport of Kings, True Light and Shade, an Aboriginal Perspective of Joseph Light's Art, and Living with the Locals, Early Indigenous Experience of Indigenous Life. He's also appeared on numerous television and radio programs, including a range of documentaries, including The Track and the Colony and Vote Yes for Aborigines. Professor Maynard's address is entitled Black to the Future, and it's with great pleasure that I invite Professor Maynard to deliver the lecture. Thank you. Uh, thank you. To begin, as a Waramai Aboriginal man um, from the Port Stephens, I'll get this to stand up somewhere, maybe down here. <laughs> from the Port Stephens region of uh, New South Wales, just north of Newcastle, I too respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulon Nation, and their ancestral lands within which I am most honoured to be a visitor. I also take time to acknowledge our elders, both past and present. And I thank Brother Bill for that um, kind welcome to country. I also wish to thank the Vice-Chancellor, Linda Christensen, um, and big respect for Andrew Gunston and uh, Simone Hamlin and all involved in putting tonight uh, together and inviting me down here to deliver the Swinburne Reconciliation Address. When I personally think of reconciliation, it encompasses a number of key points and issues for the nation. It is about recognition, it is about justice, and it is about healing. Recognition that we, as the first peoples of this country, have existed here on this continent for upwards of 50,000 years. That is something for the nation to celebrate, the oldest living memory known to humankind. And we have maintained our ongoing connection and cared for the land from the very first day. The second issue is about justice. And it is about overcoming all of those social disadvantages that can be summed up by examining the shocking statistics of Indigenous disadvantage evident in health, education, housing, employment, youth suicide, drug and alcohol, and the sickening high rates of Indigenous incarceration. I remain certain that we, as a nation, can meet and overcome these enormous challenges if we work together, as people did 50 years ago in the lead-up to the 1967 referendum. That struggle signifies that we can work together with trust and with respect. The third point, healing is a goal for the nation to strive in attaining its full potential as a global leader of equality, justice, and upholding the Australian notion of the fair go for all. The greatest treasure this nation possesses is Indigenous cultural connection to the continent. It is something to celebrate, acknowledge, embrace, and be proud of. It is also important that the nature, nation recognises the history of the past 239 years. It is not just about putting your head in the sand, hiding and hoping the past will go away. To truly heal, the nation must recognise and take responsibility for the tragedy of the past. We must face things together and work on things that are difficult and complex at times to face, but these things can be resolved. In 2017, for me, Australia stands at a crossroads. Are we heading toward a truly egalitarian and shared future of prosperity, or to the bleak future portrayed in the movie Back to the Future 2? And I've got my, you know, my t shirt on. In 
In recent times, the Australian nation has faced extreme and conflicting views over um, refugees, boat people, Australia Day, constitutional change and Indigenous issues. It is timely to look back at the past now on some of these very same issues to gain an insight on how we can take steps towards making positive change today for the future. Tonight, as a historian, I'm going to take us back into the past to examine some of the crucial issues facing Australia, as I said today, and raise some questions. Can we learn from the past? Does history repeat itself? And can we change course for the better? I confess that time travel is something that has fascinated me from an early age. H.G. Wells and the Time Machine, television series like Doctor Who and the TARDIS, the Time Tunnel, and on down to the Steven Spielberg blockbuster Back to the Future with Marty McFly and Doc Emmett Brown's DeLorean. I have not yet personally had the time or the inclination or capacity to construct my own time machine to take me into the past, but I've also always possessed that capacity through books and history. Books have provided the quantum shift that has transported me through time and space. I was from an early age through reading an addicted time traveller. I read about great heroes and heroines, Leonidas at Thermopylae and Davy Crockett at the Alamo. But for me as a young Aboriginal boy growing up, where were the black fellows in Australian history? We in effect were denied a place in this country's history. Our history was conveniently lost, forgotten, missed, overlooked, and I will add, purposefully erased. My journey coming into academia late at the age of 40 has been driven with a desire to write our stories back into the nation's memory of, of forgetfulness. I came into a university for the first time. I walked through the gate in 1993. I don't know where those years have gone now. So we have a black DeLorean waiting to go into the past, so fasten your seat belts and we'll charge up the flux capacitor. <laughs> in the lead up to Australia Day 2017, a media encouraged debate erupted over the 26th of January, continuing as the date to celebrate Australia's day. The national website for Australia Day declared that it was the day that brings the country together as a nation to celebrate what's great about Australia and being Australian. But from an Indigenous perspective, it is a day of infamy and recognition of invasion, occupation, dispossession and cultural destruction. Additionally, Australia today is not the Australia of the 1950s, with white Australia still firmly locked in place. Many nationalities share and make up this 21st century nation, and many of the new arrivals over the course of the past 50 years don't feel welcome as part of this celebration day either. Many of them are made very aware that they are not truly Australian. We need only look at the Cronulla riot to see that sort of event taking place. There was a mobilising of change last year for the Change the Date campaign to move the anniversary of the nation away from the arrival of the First Fleet. But despite sparking widespread media comment and condemnation, the One Change argument lacked one main ingredient, an alternative date. First things first, to clear up some misinformation. The 26th of January did not signify the arrival on the First Fleet on these shores. The British fleet had arrived on the 18th of January at Botany Bay, but found the location totally unsuitable. It was on the 26th of January that Philip ran up the Union Jack at Port Jackson. And it was amazing, it was not until 1946 that all states and territories adopted the current Australia Day as the name for the 26th of January celebrations. Is the move to change Australia Day from the 26th of January a recent and contemporary de debate? What of the past and of records long forgotten, what do they tell us? <coughs> the 
On the 7th of March 1925, the Australian Natives Association held their annual conference in Sydney. The ANA was a fiercely nationalistic, all-white organisation and proclaimed membership be restricted to only those Australian-born. They also demanded that only native-born Australians should represent the Commonwealth at state, at home or abroad. They also looked to amend the Constitution, moving that all governors should be, um, should be native-born Australians. It is very significant that at this conference, the ANA requested that the holiday, at the time known as Anniversary Day, Australia Day, be scrapped from the list of holidays and that the Sunday falling upon April 25th or the next Sunday following that date be observed as Anzac Day and the following Monday be recognised as Australia Day. So we have a date, we have another date. I'm sure we'll have some more dates if we, if we put it up there. But even more radical, I mean, this is an all-white organisation, the ANA, and I said they're a fiercely nationalistic group. Even more radical, the ANA demanded that Aboriginal people should be recognised as Australia's greatest asset. This is 1925 that the federal government should be requested to take control of Aboriginal affairs away from the states and to arrange for the repatriation of Aboriginal people upon their own land. This is a long time before the 1967 referendum and the move to Commonwealth to take over Aboriginal affairs. It comes as no surprise to me that the ANA could be more than 90 years ahead in thinking as the treasurer of the ANA was one John J. Maloney. Oh. John J. Maloney, where is that? And he's over here. That's in there. Maloney was a man greatly influenced by some very prominent early Aboriginal activists, including my grandfather, Fred Maynard. Maloney was a newspaper editor and gave much space and coverage to Aboriginal people and issues during the 1920s and early 30s. In a 1927 letter, he vividly outlines his anger over the treatment of Aboriginal people. The inequity of the position maddens me. To see these poor creatures kicked into the bush worse than dogs, their homes built by their own hands confiscated, no compensation, no redress, their children kidnapped by the Crown, robbed and derided by all parties, Every church equally to blame, priests, bishops, parsons, all equally guilty. No Aborigines wanted in any church, church, while God's own creatures cry for food and shelter of which they have been robbed. If I were in London, I think I would get an audience with the king. Maloney was strongly supported by a white missionary woman, Elizabeth Mackenzie Hatton. And that's Hatton. I wonder what that noise was. It sounds like the storm's coming again. <laughs> Hatton lost her first husband, and he's, he's there in that picture there, to a shark attack. She lost a daughter at the age of 10 to illness, and her son went on to fight in World War I, and he died of his wounds on the Western Front. You know, very sad experiences for a mother and to what she went through, that woman. She wrote and spoke tirelessly in support of mothers, wives and loved ones who lost family members in the Great War. She also became a great supporter of Aboriginal and Islander rights. Now, former Prime Minister John Howard has argued that Australians of the current generation should not be required to accept blame for past policies over which they had no control. Yet Mackenzie Hatton, writing in 1926, could be almost replying to John Howard across the decades by stating, and I quote, we may claim that we are not responsible for the actions of the original British invaders who violated their homes, shot, poisoned, burned and mutilated the natives, but we cannot claim immunity from the conditions existing at the present time and what should not be tolerated for one moment longer than it will take to rectify matters. The citizens comfortably situated on the shores of Port Jackson, Sydney, 
are in the main absolutely ignorant of the conditions on which, under which the natives are existent. The moment this sore is opened up, there will be a rush of apologists from the ranks of parliamentarians, parsons, priests, pedagogues, pedants and peripatetic philosophers, but such belated excuses will be brushed aside, for the fiat has gone out, justice to the natives, and the people of Australia will not be satisfied until that full measure of compensation has been accorded to a much injured and sadly wronged people. What an incredible piece of writing at that time. And she wrote a lot and she spoke a lot. Maloney and Hatton were courageous supporters of Aboriginal people and they did suffer a backlash because of it. They were very much a minority back in the 1920s, but they were brave enough to get up stand up alongside Aboriginal people and speak out for what they saw happening in this country. And I was saying just earlier outside that we as a minority in this country, heavily marginalised, we cannot make change unless we get non-Indigenous people to support us. And again out there I was saying historically we have done that. At the big moments in our history when we have made a major impact, Charlie Perkins and the Freedom Ride, a whole bunch of white students on that bus with Charlie. The Gurindji walk off at Wave Hill. Incredible trade union support for the Gurindji at that time. The 67 referendum, over 90% of the population and supporter. The Aboriginal tent embassy, Gary Foley will tell you there was a whole mob of white students from ANU in Canberra that were there speaking up and standing up beside us at that particular point in time. So these are the things we've got to recognise. We, we need non-Indigenous support and we need to encourage it. This illustrates across over 90 years how in the contemporary setting the failure to accept any blame or responsibility has continued unabated, notwithstanding Paul Keating's 1992 Red Fern speech and Kevin Rudd's apology to the stolen generations. Aboriginal suffering, inequality and disadvantage continues into the 21st century. Sadly, the country is yet to learn or come to terms with the past. The great African-American writer James Baldwin reflected in 1963 on this dilemma in relation to the United States and he said, they are in effect still trapped in a history which they do not understand and until they understand it, they cannot be released from it and this country remains a prisoner of its own past. The world is currently gripped, gripped at the moment with a huge global refugee problem. I was in Europe just before Brexit, Brexit and watched the unfolding backlash against refugees fleeing the war-torn Middle East and Africa. This was followed by Donald Trump's election in the United States and his declaration that he would erect a wall between the United States and Mexico, make America great again, and tightly control who can enter the United States. We have witnessed similar backlashes against refugees and boat people arriving in this country. This has intensified against Muslim refugees and, and, or, and immigrants. For Australia, it seems to follow a similar pattern of exclusion tied to the old white Australia policy. We have similar opposition to Greeks, Italians, Vietnamese, Lebanese peoples. Anyone of difference to the white Anglo, Anglo model has felt that exclusion. When you look at images like this one here, the fear of boat people coming to Australia is not a recent phenomenon. That's 1908, that image there. My most recent book with my wife, Victoria Haskins, was titled Living with the Locals, and it examined the stories and accounts of white people who ran away, got lost in the bush, or were shipwrecked, and lived with Aboriginal and Islander communities for extended periods of time at the very earliest point of contact. And a lot of these people were convicts, um, and as I said, shipwrecks and people like that. These people were in most instances in dire straits and would not have survived without the generosity and kindness extended to them. They were accepted into our families, communities and kinship structures. I think our current society could well learn from that experience with the current global refugee dilemma. It is important to realise that despite Paul Keating 
in his time as Prime Minister, making the call and push for Australia to make much closer ties with Asia rather than Britain and the United States. We as Aboriginal, Aboriginal people had already established long economic ties with Asia, particularly through the visits of the Macassans in the far north. Those trading ties were established nearly a thousand years ago and there was never any attempt to steal land or this country. The relationship was one based on mutual trust and economic benefit. We had Aboriginal people were going back with the Trepang trade as far as China in those days. So this was an incredible connection with Asia at that particular point in time. Now, as early as 1902, an organisation called the Coloured Progressive Association, the CPA, was established in Australia. The organisation was comprised mainly of members from the Black Commonwealth that included non-white people living in Australia, as well as visiting West Indian, Indian, African, Maori and Islander merchant sailors. Additionally, some African Americans and some Aboriginal dock workers were a part of this group. This photo is a family photo from my family. I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. The CPA apparently formed in response to the establishment of the White Australia policy in a very inhospitable Australian environment. In 1901, the newly formed, fed, the newly federated Commonwealth of Australia had passed an immigration restriction bill targeting people of non-European origin, which became known as the White Australia policy. This offensive racist act was initiated as a barrier to Asian and black immigrants um, having an opportunity to make Australia home. Criticism and objections to this policy would fall on deaf ears as the white Australia policy would remain intact until the 1960s. Now in 1902, members of the CPA sent correspondence to the British House of Commons beseeching them to repeal the white Australia policy. In that correspondence, the CPA outlined their purpose. Coloured races residing in the Commonwealth of Australia are sadly in need of the powerful assistance that a society or union established for their mutual self-help and protection will be able to afford them. We are now starting such an organisation. It is believed that every coloured person will gladly join our society as soon as they become acquainted with our aims and objects United we shall be strong to help and protect. They later wrote to the Secretary of the Colonies, Joseph Chamberlain, further protest in the newly introduced White Australia policy. The administration of the bill is vile and the general effects are undoubtedly cruel. Aliens of all kinds can enter the Commonwealth, whether they can read or write, as long as they are not black. The formation of an organisation such as the CPA was very important in helping define the spaces in which Aboriginal people moved and the identifications and alliances they formed with other oppressed groups all these years ago. Quick drink. These connections were forged between displaced people engendering the mobility not just of black populations, but importantly, of black transnational politics. The CPA may well have disappeared into historical memory, except for the visit of one important person. And as I said, this image um, is a family photo of mine. And this was always thought to be my grandfather's organisation in the 1920s, the Australian Aboriginal Progressive Association. But in the mid-90s, I was interviewing an old uncle out in western New South Wales. And he said to me, that's not the AAPA in the 1920s. He said, that's much earlier. And he said, that man there in the centre of that photo, he said, that's Mr Jack Johnson. Of course, Jack Johnson, the first black heavyweight boxing champion of the world. And you can see Johnson in that same suit there. Now, I've always been a bit of a boxing aficionado as well. And when I looked at that, and I was looking at it under a microscope, but, uh, what's not a microscope, a magnifying glass, I went back to the New South Wales State Library and spent weeks in that library going through records and, and newspaper accounts and I come up, this was actually a farewell to Jack Johnson by the Coloured Progressive Association in 1907. 
Johnson was here in 1907 and he came back in 1908. And as I said, he, he, the CPA held the farewell to, jo to Johnson in his honour and Jack Johnson was not just a great boxer but a highly politicised, charismatic and inspiring figure. I mean, he, Muhammad Ali later said that he did this, he, he modelled himself on Jack Johnson except for the white women. <laughs> he said, not the white women bit. <laughs> which Johnson certainly put in um, the white world's face quite uh, prominently. Um, future Aboriginal leader, my grandfather, Fred Maynard, is in this image, and there he is there, sitting there. So Aboriginal people were also a part of this organisation, and that was the connection through the Sydney docks. My grandfather was a wharf labourer. There were lots of Aboriginal dock workers at that particular point in time. <laughs> The connection between Aboriginal dock workers and visiting black sailors would have a major impact on the rise of early Aboriginal political activism. Again, have we learnt from the past? The behaviours of exclusion and the barriers of acceptance, tolerance, compassion and understanding seem to be the mantra of many still today. So again, as I said, the eruption of the Cronulla riots and the stuff you read in the papers, the continuing media coverage of anybody of difference in this country, it doesn't take much to scratch the surface and have that rear its ugly head. <laughs> Moving on. We have just witnessed another historical moment with a long drawn out process making constitutional recognition and reform. It has culminated with the meeting of over 200 Aboriginal people and the delivery of the Uluru Statement. The result from that meeting was a clear message on sovereignty, treaty and a First Nations voice and body under the Commonwealth Government. Of course, we had an elected national body, ATSIC, between 1990 and 2005, but where does this all sit in history? Let's go back and check. The fight for Aboriginal justice is a long one and goes back well before the 1950s and 1960s. And to be truthful, we've been fighting for justice from the time those sails first sailed into Port Jackson. So it's been a long drawn out process. But the whole process of political organised revolt also is a long one. The period 1860 to 1910 is a much misunderstood and misinterpreted period of Aboriginal history. It was a period not just in New South Wales, but also South Australia, Victoria and Queensland where Aboriginal people had re-established themselves on small land holdings in traditional country and began to prosper. I'm speaking about New South Wales here because I've had a lot of time to look at records over a lot of years, but Aboriginal people from the mid-1850s began writing petitions and letters to government. New South Wales state government asking for land in their own country. In many instances, they were written, that was self-written by Aboriginal people, and many other instances, they had non-Indigenous supporters who wrote the petitions on their behalf. When you look at those records in the archives in New South Wales, in the first instance, I mean, the, the government is saying that um, the view of the... They actually asked the police to have a look in the local area, and the response is coming back where it's heavily timbered, worthless scrub. Give it to them. So Aboriginal people began to regain this particular land. In the space of only a couple of short years, again, the archives are saying there's a report. The land has all been cleared. It's been fenced. It's been cropped. They've got homesteads on it. They've got livestock. And again, you go into those records, no one knew the seasons better than Aboriginal people in their own country. They were prospering on these independent farms. These weren't the heavily congested reserves of the 1930s onwards. These were independent farms, one and two Aboriginal families on these particular spaces of ground. Again, I've looked at the records. They're winning the blue ribbons in the agricultural shows. And there's accounts, 100 pounds cleared a year, 120 pounds cleared a year, 150 pounds, that's a lot of money. 500 pounds cleared a year. An Aboriginal family with a piano, they bought a piano. This was a very, very successful time period for us. And the sad tragedy of that is if, if that had been able to go on. I was mentioning earlier Gary Foley. He would have been here tonight. He's actually unwell. But Gary Foley's great-grandfather, Jim Doyle of Nambucca Heads on the North Coast, 
who was a member of my grandfather's organisation in the 1920s. There's a count during, just during the World War I that states that Jim Doyle, Gary Foley's great-grandfather, owned five properties. He had a boat-building enterprise. He'd invested in war bonds in World War I, and they said his wealth ran into four figures. There's a thousand pounds, was it 9,000 pounds? Whatever it was, that man was well off. Now, the catalyst for the rise of organised Aboriginal political activism in the 1920s was in direct response to what happened to that land. There was a began to be a tearing away of that land, the repossession um, of that land. Aboriginal people were basically thrown off. In many instances, again, and this is in the records, at the point of a gun by the police, there was no compensation for four, five, six decades of labour and prospering on their own land. They were thrown off with only the shirts on their backs. So the whole catalyst for the rise of Aboriginal political activism in the 1920s was in regards to this land, the revocations of this land, and the sudden taking off and acceleration of removing Aboriginal children from their families. So in 1924, we witnessed the formation of the Australian Aboriginal Progressive Association, the AAPA. This organisation is recognised today as the country's first organised and united all Aboriginal political organisation. Oh, another, I should have got into this one earlier. This highlights that land loss, the revocation of that land. And you can see in the yellow where the land's been won by Aboriginal people. This is New South Wales. And then between 1910 and 1930, the tearing away of that land. Some 27,000 acres of Aboriginal land on prime real estate that was torn away during that time period. Now here's the AAPA. Um, and that's their, their emblem. My grandfather up there, Tom Lacey, Dick Johnson, Sid Ridgway, um, Cora Ridgway, Cora Robertson, my grandfather's cousin, Jane Duren, Ben Rowntree and his wife. These were the, some of the prominent office bearers of the Sydney branch, the central branch of the AAPA in the 1920s. At its height, the AAPA had 13 branches, four sub-branches and more than 600 members. Many of the members of this early Aboriginal political movement, including prominent office bearers Dick Johnson, who's pictured here, Ben Rowntree at the top, and Edward Walker, were returned soldiers from World War I. Brothers and sisters, we have much business to transact, so let's get right down to it. Those are the very words expressed by my grandfather, Fred Maynard, at the beginning of his inaugural address as president of the Australian Aboriginal Progressive Association in Sydney in April 1925. His speech marked the opening of the first Aboriginal Civil Rights Convention ever staged in this country. It was conducted at St David's Church and Hall on the corner of Arthur and Riley Streets in Surrey Hills. The AAPA were instantly front page news with headlines trumpeting on Aborigines' aspirations, first Australians to help themselves, self-determination. And Aborigines in conference, self-determination is their aim to help a people. This is an amazing revelation. Self-determination as a platform being expressed by Aboriginal activists five decades before the Whitlam government's directive which is widely attributed with in instigating self-determination as Aboriginal policy. It was noted that over 200 enthusiastic Aboriginal people were in attendance and they heartily supported the objectives of the association. My grandfather wasted no time in outlining the, uh, the AAP's objectives. And as it says up there, we aim at the spiritual, the political, the industrial and the social. We want to work out our own destiny our people have not had the courage to stand together in the past, but now we are united and are determined to work for the preservation for all of those interests which are near and dear to us. We want to work out our own destiny. Strong statement. You might gather from this talk I have a bit of admiration for James Baldwin as a writer because many years later he captures the importance of that statement he says, when a black man whose destiny and identity have always been controlled by others decides and states 
that he will control his own destiny and rejects the identity given to him by others, he is talking revolution. In point of sober fact, he cannot be talking anything else. So these early Aboriginal activists had granted their political demands around connection to land and a platform organised on bettering conditions economically, socially, politically and culturally. Aboriginal claims to their land were also bluntly expressed to the New South Wales Premier, my grandfather stating, the Australian Aboriginal people are the original owners of the land and have a prior right over all other people in this respect. These early Aboriginal activists were articulate, eloquent and educated statesmen and women, far removed from the wider misconceptions of the time period that portrayed us as belonging to the Stone Age, unable to be educated and a dying race. All of these people were self-educated. They didn't come through you know, major school or university or colleges. They were self-educated. The AAPA would eventually hold four annual conferences in Sydney, Kempsey, Grafton and Lismore before they were harassed and hounded out of existence by the police acting for the New South Wales Aborigines Protection Board. Now, I'll just highlight some of these spots up here. That's the David's Protection Hall there. It's still there today. And I'd certainly like to do something with that building in Sydney. As early as 1924, with Hatton, Mackenzie Hatton, who I noted before, the Aboriginal activists in Hatton set up a home in Sydney for Aboriginal girls who'd been taken away by the Protection Board and apprenticed into the domestic service scheme and into white households in Sydney, but ran away and were on the streets in Sydney. This home was set up for those girls, for their protection. It was under constant police surveillance and harassment from the police. They even called in a Crown solicitor to try and have it closed down. Um, that's Kempsey Showground, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, about that second conference. And that's Newcastle. It's both these two places on the corner of Crown and Hunter Street. My grandfather and those activists went to Newcastle in 1925 and again in 1927. My grandfather spoke there as well in 1927. <clears throat> the AAPA attracted widespread support from Indigenous communities and news of the organisation spread rap rapidly through an active Indigenous community network. The formation of the organisation filled Aboriginal people with hope and inspiration with the knowledge that some of their own were now speaking out against the oppressive policies that confronted Aboriginal people and communities. One old man wrote from a far back settlement asking that someone should come and tell them about the Freedom Club. <coughs> the Kempsey Conference in 1925, and again, that, that big coloured picture there, deserves recognition of one of the most significant and momentous moments in Aboriginal political history. But it, like much of this story, has been missed in Australian history. Very few people really know of these events, you know, even blackfellas themselves. And there's a reason for that as well. <laughs> now, this conference in Kempsey in 1925 ran over three days, October 1925. The Maclay Argus and the Maclay Chronicle, two newspapers in Kempsey, state over 700 Aboriginal people were in attendance at that three-day conference. That's seven times the number at the day of mourning in 1938. Over three days, all the papers were written and delivered, again, the newspapers say this, by Aboriginal people. And the issues, they remained at the forefront of our demands today. What those people back in 1925 were speaking about were health, education, housing, children, employment and land. And one of the really critical things that is mentioned in those newspapers is, and this is a time when the anthropologists are just starting to break through, and they're saying culture in southeastern Australia is gone. There is no languages. We had, it's, it's gone. This conference, over that three days, the papers quite clearly say quite a number of those papers were delivered in lingo. And you've got 700 Aboriginal people there, culture's not gone. They could quite clearly understand. And those people come from the south coast. 
They come from Sydney and Newcastle. They come from the north coast. They come from southwestern New South Wales, northwestern New South Wales, central western New South Wales, Queensland border, and yet they could all understand. So language and culture wasn't gone. In 1927, the AAPA issued a manifesto, and this has also been missed by history, of Aboriginal demands that was widely published by the press, not just in New South Wales, but in Victoria, South Australia and Queensland. The AAPA pushed the concept of a pan-Aboriginal identity and a national agenda for improving Aboriginal conditions, including the call for enough land for each and every Aboriginal family in the country national land rights. That was on their agenda. And that Aboriginal affairs be governed by an all Aboriginal board that sits directly under the Commonwealth Government. This is 1927 when this has gone out. An all Aboriginal board. Think again about the recent Uluru Statement. Here we are in 2017, they're thinking of a, an Aboriginal board to sit under the... This was being said in 1927. Now, on 31st, 31st of March 1928, Ben Rowntree, as I said before, a returned Aboriginal soldier and the secretary at that point of the AAPA, wrote to the Commonwealth Government Royal Commission on the Constitution and he forcefully endorsed the national agenda and policy. And he said, We heartily endorse the views of the Commission now sitting at Canberra and pledge ourselves to stand solid behind the Commission for the emancipation of the whole of our conditions and people throughout Australia. Our unswerving loyalty is with you in the fight for the federalising of the whole of Aboriginal affairs and the abolition of state control. 1928, you know, we're talking about what happened in 1967. We had to wait another 40 years for the Commonwealth to take over. <clears throat> Whilst my grandfather, and I said he was a wharf labourer, referenced the loyalty, fidelity and bravery of Aboriginal servicemen in the Great War, he was also a member of the Waterside Workers' Union, who had vociferously opposed and helped defeat Prime Minister Billy Hughes' conscription referendum twice. Of greater significance to my grandfather was the fact that a catastrophic war had taken place on the Australian continent. On several occasions, he used the word extermination. Of course, we know the word genocide didn't come through until the 1940s. But on several occasions, he said that government policy was about exterminating Aboriginal people in this country. <coughs> in his mind, there was no question that a war had been waged. I'm getting a bit dry <laughs> again. I've been moving a lot in the last 10 days. <laughs> Lots of planes. <clears throat> In a letter to Jack Lang, the New South Wales State Premier, he said that the European people by the arts of war destroyed our more ancient civilization is freely admitted and that by their vices and diseases <clears throat> our people have been decimated is also patent. But neither of these are facts of evidence of superiority Quite the contrary is the case. The members of the AAPA have also noted the strenuous efforts of the trade union leaders to attain the conditions which existed in our country at the time of invasion by Europeans. The men only worked when necessary. We called no man master and we had no king. And it's interesting to see that word invasion here. And that's some years looking back at the history walls, there was a great eruption over the word invasion. And this was an invention of left-wing ratbags that had managed to coerce some Aboriginal activists to jump on board with this whole concept. My grandfather said this in 1927. The Australian Aboriginal Progressive Association succeeded for a short time in slowing the taking of Aboriginal children from their families and the revoking of Aboriginal land. But the single biggest impact of the organisation was through the inspiration provided by its articulating an Aboriginal political voice. However, the AAPA disappeared from public view in 1928. Startling recently uncovered material reveals that the New South Wales police played a major role in its breakup. I only uncovered this in the last 12 months as a, 
a newspaper interview with my grandfather and he indicates the level of intimidation he was subjected to. And he stated he had been warned on many occasions that the doors of Long Bay Jail were opening for him. And he said he would cheerfully go to jail for the remainder of his life if by so doing he could make the people of Australia realise the truly frightful administration of the Aborigines Act. And I must say, I mean, several weeks ago, I, I still upsets me, but I lost my father. And he was my conduit through to my grandfather. I never met my grandfather. He died eight years before I was born. But my father, they were young kids when their father died. But he was a conduit to me about all a lot of that stuff. It happened to them as a family. And there was, as I said, a lot of police intimidation. My father recalled a story to me at the age of five or six. Him and another Koori kid in Sydney were picked up by the police and taken to Canterbury Police Station. This is in probably about 1936, 1937. And my father said to me, that day in that police station, and he said, five or six year old kid, it was the most frightening moment of his entire life. Now, I have to tell you, my father went on to a career as a jockey, a long one. Um, and I've seen him on life support and in intensive care units for weeks at a time. For him to say that, that that day in that police station as a little boy is the most frightening moment of his life, you can realise the impact that it had on him. The message, as he said later, was, was quite clear. The police to get a message through to his father, my grandfather, to put up or shut up, we can pick up your kids any time we like. Late 1930s, Aboriginal activist Bill Ferguson would later recall that the AAPA was handed out of existence by the police acting for the board. The 1931 Australian Communist Party publication on the rights of Aborigines revealed that the AAPA was destroyed through a coalition of opposition formed between the government Aborigines protection boards, the missionaries and the police. The AAPA, however, left a lasting legacy as Aboriginal people were encouraged to step forward and voice demands on behalf of their people. That continues to this day. Now, in conclusion, it is so very important, not just for Aboriginal Australia, but the wider community as a whole to recognise and learn from the past. At the close of that Kempsey conference, the three-day Kempsey conference, as I said, back in 1925, my grandfather delivered a very powerful resolution. And this was forwarded on to the Commonwealth government, state governments, and was published widely across New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland, this, even South Australia, this, um, this particular news of this conference. And he said, as it is the proud boast of Australia that every person born beneath the Southern Cross is born free, irrespective of origin, race, colour, creed, religion or any other impediment, we, the representatives of the original people in conference assembled, demand that we shall be accorded the same full right and privileges of citizenship as are, as are enjoyed by all other sections of the community. And I think we could learn a lot from a statement like that as a nation still today. The events, people and voices of the past can inspire and lead this country to, to a new shared future of prosperity where we are truly reconciled. Sad we are left to ponder and lament on what might have been from 93 years ago. If the AAPA demands for enough land for each and every Aboriginal family in the country had been met back in 1927, we would have witnessed over several decades of Aboriginal opportunity to build on a solid base of economic independence. If the demand had been met to stop the board's practice of removing Aboriginal children from their families, we would not have endured another five decades of that horrific policy. And if a rich Aboriginal cultural base had been recognised and protected, we would not now be entwined in the slow process of putting together a fragmented jigsaw puzzle with many of the important cultural pieces, including language and story, missing. If the demand that the Commonwealth Government take charge of Aboriginal affairs 40 years before the 1967 referendum, and that an all Aboriginal board be placed in charge of Aboriginal affairs to oversee Aboriginal policy, what a different world we could be in today.
I'll just go, and I've just, I've just been up on the north coast of New South Wales. I've got a, I'm doing a, a, a large research project on the history of the New South Wales Aborigines Protection Board. And I've recently spent time at Taree, Port Macquarie, Kempsey, Armidale, Coffs Harbour, Grafton, Nambuck Airheads, Barraville. And this is Kempsey Showground. That place is still there, that old building from 1925. And it's certainly the intention of me and others. I mean, I've been in contact with Gary Foley some time back in regards to this, that we hold a conference next year in 2018. I don't want to put it off till 2025. You never know, we might not be here. <laughs> I'm getting up to that number where <laughs> you're scratching your head and thinking, I'm still here. But um, at Foley's are saying, no, brother, don't put it off too long, let's go. <laughs> so, so yes, we, we aim to, to hold a, a major Aboriginal history uh, conference there next year and in commemoration of that 1925 um, conference. So in looking back at my points tonight, it does appear that history repeats. But have we learned from the past to make change for the best? For the early Aboriginal activists and their supporters, the fight was all about making change for the good of all Aboriginal people. And that is an important lesson and reminder for us as Aboriginal people today. I have to say, I mean, you know, you look at, at the last 25, 30 years, I mean, I get frustrated and, and despondent at times. I mean, I think for me personally, since the introduction of native title, we've spent most of our time fighting amongst ourselves. And we've got to get back to that powerful movement of the 60s, 70s and 80s and going back to this stuff where it was all about making change for the good of all of our people and needing non-Indigenous support. So to all of our people, here present tonight and those people that support us. The struggle for justice and equality for all people in our land goes on. Thank you. Thanks very much, John. We've got time for a couple of questions. Any, any questions? Thank you so much for an absolutely inspiring presentation. That was really wonderful. Um, I'm very interested in that graph that you showed of the land um, uh, that was allowed to be held by Aboriginal people and then it was revoked. And there seemed to be an absolute tipping point um, you know, around the time of the First World War. I'm just interested in what triggered that tipping point. Well, I think it was 1910, the, the, well, certainly the board in New South Wales had been, how can you say, they hadn't been so controlling, and it certainly changed with amendments to the Act in 1909 and again in 1916. And that was the period, and there was a lot of pressure on the board by increasing settlement, pushing out. And the land that these people wanted, of course, I don't want that land down there, I want that land. And it had all been cleared, fenced and cropped. And also, also impacting on that was the soldier settlement scheme during World War I. And there was a major impact from that. A lot of the Aboriginal land being handed over to returning white soldiers from Gallipoli and the Western Front was these independent reserves and farms. There's a lot of archival evidence into that. And Aboriginal soldiers, I mean, I'm involved with a major project with Mick Dodson serving our country, which was looking at the history of Aboriginal servicemen and women from the Boer War right through to now. And I have to say there's incredible pride amongst Aboriginal families and communities of their forebears who fought for this country. But the process of Aboriginal men returning from World War I, there's many instances they were told the soldier resettlement scheme doesn't apply to you. Um, so there's that. Um, I will say, I mean, for a long period of time, I was under the impression there was only one man uh, in New South Wales that had got a soldier settlement. But that has expanded probably about six. But that's a small number when you realise that there was... Today we've jumped up to... in. 1988 bicentennial, there was a study of Aboriginal military service, and I think it was about 230 Aboriginal men had served in First World War. Today, it's over a thousand. The records are there, and I will say that project is amazing in the sense of the military keep incredible records, so you can you've got something to look at. Whereas a lot of records, 
in the, the other spaces have disappeared, and certainly in relation to my grandfather with the police. You know, I've been into archives there and I continually come under this issue there. Oh, in the past there was a fire and all those records have gone and then you'll go on to another one. Oh, there was another fire. And I actually, you know, with the arsonists running around in here, <laughs> they're setting fire to everything. <laughs> but, yeah, but that, that certainly impacted it was World War I when that, when that went up. Thank you, Professor Maynard, for your um, talk. I really enjoyed it and learned a lot. Um, my question or ask for your comment or thoughts on New Zealand seem to deal with their first people so much better than what we do. They do, the, the white puck here, New Zealanders stand side by side with the Maori um, players and they do the haka together. Adam Goods does one little dance and the world goes crazy. Yeah. What lessons can we learn from New Zealand? Yeah, well, we could learn lots of lessons from everywhere. But if you speak to the Maori brothers and sisters over there, I'm sure they will tell you they've got complaints of their own in regards. OK, they have the treaty, but they are still behind the, the eight ball, if you like, in regards to many things. But look, the British, or when they came here, had obviously learned lessons from Canada, the United States, and wherever else they went. Um, and it was mentioned earlier, I mean, and Bill, I think he's gone now, but in, in regards to the first impact of disease into this country. I mean, um, a lot of the British Marines in Sydney had been with Amherst and with the war against Pontiac where smallpox blankets were released. And I mean, and people argue against that, that suddenly smallpox just appeared here, <laughs> you know, and said that, but when you've got those Marines who were in that space and they actually used, and that's in the records that Amherst used that as a weapon, and it is true that um, Butlin's study in the 80s about the impact of that here in this country was some, something like in the first four decades, and he actually put our population much higher, Noel Butlin as well, or something like a million. Everybody tries to keep that population down, you know, but he estimated over a million Aboriginal people here. And he says that in over just four decades, uh, the impact on Aboriginal Australia was something like 60 to 90% of the population had been swept away. That's an incredible impact on, the, on the, this, this country. Yeah, so. <laughs> Other countries, yes, but they've got problems as well. <laughs> thanks again very much, John. Oh, thanks, Andrew. Thanks, thanks, very, much. thanks, All right, very, thanks much. very much. All right, thanks very much. And thank all you guys for coming along. It, um, it's been great. Thanks a lot. Thanks again, John. Um, just like to um, thank very much Simone Hamlin and the rest of the team from Student Engagement for putting all this together. So thanks very much, Simone. Thanks for attending and um, good evening. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>